Um, so, um, this uh, symposium is about uh, mathematical difficulties and um, interventions. And I am going to give a short um, presentation on uh, on um, how um, children's mathematical difficulties may affect or be associated with uh, their ability to use derived fact strategies. Are you seeing my um, PowerPoint? Great. Okay, so um, without further ado, this is a talk on derived fact strategies. One of the most crucial aspects of arithmetical reasoning is the ability to derive and predict unknown arithmetical facts from known facts on the basis of arithmetical principles. For example, if we know that 44 plus 23 is 67, we may use the commutativity principle to um, derive the fact that 23 plus 44 must also be 67. We may also use um, addition of one to work out that um, 44 plus 24 is 68. There are quite a few uh, principles one can use, some of which I will discuss here. And one important question is whether the use of derived fact strategies is significantly worse in children with known mathematical difficulties than in unselected children. This is a reasonably possible, both because um, working memory may be important in simultaneously focusing on an arithmetical problem and uh, using a, a, a strategy to um, sort out a new, a, a new fact. And um, the worse of working memory limitations could affect derived fact strategy performance. Also, um, core factual knowledge might interfere with the ability to acquire use of, um, uh, of known uh, facts, but and the general strategy, the strategies of um, you know, progressing from these by uh, extra um, reasoning strategies. Um, uh, on, uh, um, some studies do show that children with mathematical difficulties often over rely on counting strategies at the expense both of retrieval and derived fact strategy use. On the other hand, some children may use derived fact strategies to compensate for limitations in factual knowledge, as in fact has been found in some adults with dyscalculia, which involves difficulty in factual retrieval. So, in the present study, we looked at 339 children from Oxford primary schools. Of these children, 204 were selected by their teachers for an intervention project because they had mathematical difficulties. This testing was done before the intervention. And the other 135 children were um, unselected. This doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't have mathematical difficulties, but they were not viewed as such. And um, they were of similar age, I mean, age 81 to 82 months, and um, similar proportions of boys and girls. And in the study, each child was first given a list of 20 mental addition sums, which graduated in difficulty from 4 plus 5 to 235 plus 349, and were assessed or uh, assigned to an addition performance level on the basis of the calculation pretest. 
um, and there were six potential levels, but only the first four are relevant to the present study. One is the beginning arithmetic level where children can usually count to 10 or higher and do basic concrete arithmetic up to at least five, but can answer very few items in the calculation test and basically have little factual knowledge, even of basic facts. Um, the second is the facts to 10 level. Children at this level can solve addition of sums that add up to no more than 10, but aren't reliable with larger add-ins. Then the facts to 25 level, where children can solve single digit addition sums and sums that involve slightly higher numbers, such as 11 plus 12, but they can't yet deal effectively with tens and units and rarely respond correctly to sums mm -hmm. that add up to more than 25. Sure and then the two digit addition that carry a level where they can solve two digit addition so sums just sure. as long as, mm -hmm. no as no carrying is required. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we uh, gave them standardized tests of arithmetic, which were are the WISC arithmetic, uh, which is a section of an IQ test, but we were not here using it to measure IQ, which predominantly consists of word problem solving and is oral, and the British Abilities Skills Basic Number Skills Test, which is mainly a test of written arithmetic. And both uh, ANOVA showed that bo both um, the WISC score and the British Abilities score were significantly and independently affected by both the group whether one was classed as having mathematical difficulties or not, and by uh, the addition performance level. So um, those who performed better at addition did better in these standardized tests. So did um, children who did and didn't have, uh, who um, didn't have mathematical difficulties. And these um, and then I gave them a derived fact strategies test, which involved um, strategies based on uh, five uh, on, on, um, principles. And the exact principles given varied according to the previously assessed calculation level and were selected to be just a little too difficult for the child to solve unaided. Um, and they were given the answer to a problem and were then asked to solve another problem that could be solved quickly by using this answer plus the principle. So for commutativity, they might be shown the problem 23 plus 44 is 67, and then asked how much is 44 plus 23, and problems proceeded by answers to numerically unrelated problems were given as controls. So the principles were the identity principle, if one is told that, for example, eight plus six is 14, one can give the answer 14 without calculating it if asked what's eight plus six. This might seem so obvious that it's really a same fact rather than derived fact strategy, but as we'll see, not all children use it. Then the commutativity principle, which we've discussed, um, the n plus one principle, if 23 plus 44 is 67, 23 plus 45 must be 68. The n minus one principle, if nine plus eight is 17, nine plus seven is 17 minus one or 16. Then one of which we didn't use with these young children, so I won't discuss it here. And then the addition, subtraction, inverse principle, 
if 46 plus 27 is 73, then 73 minus 27 is 46. And the child was deemed to use a principle if they could explain it or and or if they could use it to derive at least two out of three unknown arithmetical facts where they couldn't when there wasn't an opportunity to use the principle. Um, so um, this table, I don't know how clearly you can see it, gives use of specific principles by children with and without mathematical difficulties and uh, the, the um, children without mathematical difficulties um, usually could use identity and commutativity and about half the time um, uh, the um, n plus one, print add-ons plus one, n plus one principle, the children with mathematical difficulties usually could use identity, but not always, and only a minority use the others, and in all cases, um, group differences were significant. And um, the, similarly with the different performance levels, all, um, most children fact of the facts to 10 or above level used identity. Um, most children of higher levels used commutativity. Um, and um, an only um, at the addition no carrying level did they consistently use the addend plus one and addend minus one principles and only a quarter even at that level used the inverse principle and there were consistent um there, there was very significant group, group differences in the frequency of all the principles um as regards the um a more general findings of children with and without mathematical difficulties, similar age, much higher scores on the standardized tests, and also the unselected children used um, significantly more derived fact strategies. Um, so um, overall, um, uh, one uh, um, children with mathematical difficulties used only one strategy, usually identity, and unselected children used two or more um, strategies. Um, similar at different performance levels, uh, the children of higher performance levels were older in this case, uh, also scored higher on the standardized tests, also used more derived fact strategies. So at the two-digit addition, no carrying level, mean 3.14, um, derived fact strategies used at the beginning arithmetic level, only 0.37. So many didn't use any. Um, and not surprisingly, the number of derived fact strategies used was significantly affected by the addition performance level. So unsurprisingly, it was not affected by group the children. Um, once you um, controlled for addition performance level, um, group didn't uh, show any significant effect and there was no significant interaction between group, that is mathematical difficulties or no mathematical difficulties and addition performance level. Um, uh, so, um, whereas group, both um, group and mathematical difficulties are not and performance level independently influenced the standardized tests. Um, uh, the, uh, so, why would it be that uh, the addition performance level would influence derived fact strategy use, but uh, the well, when classification, the grouping of mathematical difficulties versus no mathematical difficulties did not. Um, it might be possibly how um, mathematical difficulties are assessed, possibly related to the fact that British schools 
use a lot of formal testing to monitor performance. And although these aren't the same tests used in the study, they are accustomed to assessing mathematical ability through tests. And this may mean that selection of the group with mathematical difficulties was particularly influenced by characteristics that are typically measured on tests, um, which would include both calculation and word problem solving and less associated with derived fact strategy use as such. Um, so um, I think we can conclude by saying that um, derived fact strategy use certainly seems to be quite closely associated with arithmetic performance, um, but is rather less clearly associated with at least whether one's classed as having mathematical difficulties or not, which may say something about mathematical difficulties or may say something about how they're assessed. So I will conclude. Um, and um, I believe that the next speaker will be Flavia Santos. Okay, I, I, I think you need to stop sharing for I yes, to share mine. Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, so here it is. Okay, let me show you the first slide. So I think everybody can see it, right? So first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here, join all of you and especially my colleagues in this symposium. So I would present the calculator's efficacy in children with developmental dyscalculia, testing a shorter protocol. Uh, this work is actually a master and PhD thesis of two students of mine, Lien and Jessica, which are not able to present today. And um, let's see. Yes. Well, intervention effectiveness is associated with directed or assisted instruction, strain of basic arithmetical competences, and it occurs regardless of learning age, which is something good. Uh, some studies have uh, shown that it's important to have shorter interventions and mainly if they are adaptive. In the case of computer-based interventions, we know that they can be effective as interventions with human tutors. As, ma as, as many as with human tutors, they have economic and affective advantages and they contribute to reduce socioeconomic gap in maths achievement. And here I just highlighted a few um, well uh, known uh, interventions who are already published and tested uh, in other studies. But among them, I would like to talk about calcularis, which is the one we, we used in our study. So Calcularis is a mathematical learning software, which helps learning uh, in a different way. So in a few characteristics, it has 17 different games or variations. Uh, it is played 15 to 20 minutes a day, three, four times a week, and for a minimal period of 12 weeks. It, it can be played anywhere, as long as the child has a computer or a tablet in, connected to the internet. And the results are um, measured in real time. So the progress can be measured in real time. These are the main skills assessed by the instrument, including subtitles, estimating, transcoding, also uh, arith uh, arithmetics and number line. There are three important studies uh, regarding calcularis uh, in terms of efficacy. They have other studies about the algorithm and uh, other issues, but specifically about efficacy, we have three important studies and all of them were carried out in children from second to fifth grades. And um, they always had randomized design. So they compared trained and untrained children and exceptionally on the 
Rauscher's work, they had also a third group who did the spelling. And um, overall, they had more than 24 sessions. And in the study of Khan, they had more than 42 sessions. And uh, the period was between six to 13 weeks. The main outcomes in all uh, the studies uh, the main outcomes were uh, consistent. So they found improvements in uh, subtractions like improving accuracy and speed, but also in additions and number line estimation. So uh, when I saw those results, I, I've got really excited. However, I, I couldn't avoid to think, well, these are, uh, these studies were carried out in, um, German speaking countries, which have well known and high quality education, and uh, they are developing developed countries. So we know that it will impact the results. So I was wondering if it would be successful in a different venue. So I tried to carry out this study in Brazil with my students. And why Brazil? Um, so Brazil is a huge country. It has 8.5 million square meters. So it's so big as the US or Canada. Uh, the number of inhabitants is 12, uh, 212 million uh, inhabitants, which is really populated. Uh, the GP GDP is 3.8 trillions, which means the eighth economy in the world. And the human development index is 0 0.76, which means high development. So based on those numbers, impressive numbers, we would say, well, probably the results will be the same, right? However, we must remember that Brazil is a country with history of slavery, colonial colonialism, and corruption, which leads to um, Gini index of 54, which is really high, indicating high levels of inequalities or inequities. And those inequities are very uh, evident on education. So if we, if we just take a look on the PISA study, we'll see that for reading, mathematics, and science, in the three cases, uh, the Brazilian average was below OECD uh, average, which is the blue line. And if you're looking at mathematics in particular, we can see that unfortunately from 2013 to 2018, we don't see an ascending progression or improvement in their performances. Another uh, issue that's important about Brazil is that um, the access to technology is very limited for the general population. So we, we, in this study, they find out that in 2019, uh, only 41% of the students had a desktop in the less individuals had laptops and tablets at home. And this is important to highlight that this, the data is regarding urban areas. So in rural areas, we have even lower scores. Uh, we could say, well, okay, they don't have computers at home, but they will have at school, right? No, um, according to this uh, survey, um, they, um, if you're looking at the blue bars, uh, we can see that um, teachers highlight that there are an insufficient number of computers per student, an insufficient number of computers connected to the internet, obsolete and outdated equipments, low speed and connections to the internet, lack of technical support and equipment maintenance. And I will stop here because there are lots of other issues, uh, problematic issues regarding to this. So what are the characteristics of our RCT uh, in Brazil? First of all, we are an independent research group trying to test the efficacy of capillaries in a developing country. And uh, our sample uh, is based in children that is barely familiar with computers. Uh, we decided to use an approach of co uh, training in groups rather than individually or at home. So they were trained at school. And we are, we are also contrasting a non-adaptive training, which is something that we will discuss later, and testing a shorter protocol because we know that um, for these children, we, we can even see in some cases, I have a previous history trying to use like a COGMED and things like this. And there's actually a, a technological phobia 
to uh, precisely the lack of experience with those resources. Uh, so the, the study was carried out at Sao Paulo State University in NESPI, and uh, the study design was random and blind, and we were contrasting pre and post training in cognitive tasks. We had three groups, so children were located randomly, and then uh, we had the adaptive group who received the couplers as it is supposed to be. The waiting uh, list, which was the business as usual. So, but of course, at the end of the, the RCT, we offered the, 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 the program for them. And the no adaptive group, which was, uh, in, which was in the same situation as adaptive in the sense that they were at school in groups, practicing the training, uh, but the training had no adaptive feature which means that it would never progress, becomes more difficult or more challenging for them. Uh, we calculate sample size for within between interactions um, and we find out that we would need at least 54 children to uh, measure the, the results. But in our sample, we've got 66. So at least we had power to measure it. And um, as you know, the prevalence of uh, development of dyscalculia is around 6%. So in, because in Brazil there is no associations for children with dyscalculia, at least not in that region we were, uh, we had to do first of all a screening study. So we started the study with 888 children and those children were assessed and we find and we found eight, seven that had, uh, that came to the neuropsychological assessment to confirm diagnosis. So after that, we allocated the participants in the three groups. And of course we had a few um, attrition situations, uh, which I will not detail for a question of time now. So we had 66 children, third and fourth graders with developmental dyscalculia. These children were all Portuguese speakers and they had, they, their family socioeconomic status was lower middle class. As you can see by the salaries here, about 400 or $500 uh, per month. So very, very little. And they were from schools in um, in São Paulo State, uh, in São Paulo State, and they were in public schools. Our protocol included a measure of development, a measure of socioeconomic status, but also uh, executive functions, reasoning, numerical cognition, and working memory. And uh, on the baseline. The three groups, let's say adaptive, non-adaptive, and waiting group, they were equivalent concerning age, gender, um, matrix, um, Raven's matrix, colored progressive matrix, <laughs> Raven's colored progressive matrix, which means uh, the visual spatial reasoning, arithmetic and reading. The only difference was in writing uh, where this um, um, no adaptive group was slightly better in writing. And the results, of course, we are just highlighting the interactions uh, between time of assessment and groups. So we found a difference uh, in uh, the total score where the adaptive group performance better in the post-training and this improvement was higher than in comparison to non-adaptive and to waiting list uh, groups. We also found the equivalent results for subtraction and problem solving. But I would like to mention a few other issues that I concern, import, concern that are important uh, regarding to the findings we had. First of all, the waiting list did not perform, improved at all. So definitely we are desperate to find the solutions and interventions because the business as usual is not helping, okay? Uh, the non-adaptive group uh, as, um, let's say group effect improved in some numerical as aspects, which means that training early number numbers might be beneficial even if it's not adaptive and then we, we cannot deny, I think it was really important based on, 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 on the dynamics of the, the, the experience that the group sessions, um, the presence of a tutor 
it was very important for changing their motivation and uh, this, the aspect of being monitored in their training. So I think that's very important. For the adaptive group, of course, we've got the successful results in numerical cognition, but we also saw a high standard deviation. And even if you're looking at this graphic, which compares uh, average scores, one standard, two and three standard deviations, we can see that, of course, we had a decrease of children with impairment after the training, but it's still a, a, a huge number of cases with individual differences. So we must uh, warn people that in some cases we need a longer protocol for a successful treatment. So overall, I can say that this RCT carry out in a developing country using passive and active control groups uh, was successful to show uh, improvements in subtraction and problem solving for children with developmental dyscalculia that were barely familiar with computers. And uh, they obtained uh, uh, benefits with 20 sessions. So it means that a shorter protocol can be actually effective. So just for finishing, I would like to be uh, to, to make acknowledgements for the children, parents, teachers, and schools who uh, support our study, but especially Professor Michael von Aster, which is the one who actually uh, is uh, important for the development of these uh, interventions and uh, the instruments used for assessment and the um, CEO from Dibuster Calcularis, Christian, um, my students, Liene and Jessica, and the undergraduate students who were collaborating as tutors in this intervention. I also would like to thank you very much for all of you here present today for your attention. Thank you. So I think I, I can stop sharing. And can you tell which which we who who is the next presenter, please? I think it's Eline. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. I will share my screen. Uh, okay. So do you see the screen too? Okay, perfect. Hi everyone, um, I'm Eline. I'm a postdoc in the lab of Berthe Smet. And today I want to dive into part of my doctoral work with you all. Uh, my primary interest is in the large individual differences in arithmetic skills between children. So not a very categorical approach uh, of math difficulties in my talk today, but a more uh, broad uh, individual differences approach. Um, and maybe you identify with one of these children, uh, maybe you were the smiling kid during math class, or maybe it was you that already started moaning a little uh, when the math teacher came in. And if we look at the um, reasoning behind this, these individual differences, a lot of research into these differences in arithmetic has focused on factors such as um, numerical magnitude processing, metacognition, executive functions, and also math anxiety. Um, but the uh, main problem with this research, in my opinion, is that it's mostly done in isolated fields with studies investigating either numerical magnitude processing or executive functions or math anxiety, uh, but not simultaneously. And studies that do look at the interaction between these factors provide interesting insights into the interplay of the factors in arithmetic skills that could provide us valuable in input for, um, for education and interventions. Uh, now, one particularly interesting question um, is whether the associations that are found in the literature between uh, these cognitive, these most cognitive factors, uh, such as metacognition and arithmetic, are um, affected by effect. And concerning effect, um, we were um, especially interested in math anxiety, which is a feeling of tension and uh, anxiety that increased with the manipulation of numbers and solving of mathematical problems in ordinary life and uh, in academic situations. 
if you think about it, mathematic anxiety could indeed play a role in the association between uh, arithmetic and other more cognitive factors. And in the study I want to present to you today, we especially focused on the interplay uh, between math anxiety and metacognitive monitoring. And that brings me to the title of my talk. Uh, are children too anxious to be confident? And in this talk, I will walk you through my research in the context of arithmetic on the interplay between math anxiety on the one hand and metacognition on the other. Let's have a quick look at how I defined metacognition in my research. Um, it's often broadly defined as um, thinking about your thinking. And importantly, metacognition is a very broad concept uh, encompassing many different aspects. And therefore, uh, we specifically focused on one aspect of metacognition, which we thought was very promising, namely metacognitive monitoring. And that can be defined as um, the subjective self-assessment of how well a cognitive task uh, will be, is, or has been performed. Um, you, it's likely that math anxiety and metacognition are associated as both processes are related to a reflection on your arithmetic performance and both are associated with individual differences in arithmetic achievement. And moreover, at the theoretical level, um, different hypotheses have been um, put forward on the existence and the, on the existence and the direction uh, of the interrelation between children's math anxiety and monitoring uh, on the other hand. For example, on the one hand, children's math anxiety uh, might influence their um, metacognitive monitoring. Specifically, uh, math anxiety might hinder the effic efficiency for children's metacognitive monitoring as anxiety might impair um, your goal-directed attentional system, which is needed for uh, monitoring. For example, uh, you can have a biased interpretation of your actual performance, uh, an underestimation uh, of success, or an overestimation of failure. Um, so both are um, inaccurate monitoring of your performance. Uh, that could be caused by math anxiety. Another possibility could be that math anxiety leads to rumination and preoccupying thoughts that uh, consume your cognitive resources that could otherwise be used for monitoring. And finally, math anxiety might lead to exaggerated um, metacognitive monitoring, such as um, exaggerated double checking answers, uh, which um, in which math anxious children may compensate for anxiety-related processing inefficiency. Um, another um, piece of the puzzle, on the other hand, it has been suggested that children's monitoring might influence their math anxiety, although that direction has been considered uh, far less than its counterpart. Specifically, again, um, metacognitive monitoring might lead to uh, math anxiety, Again, inaccurate monitoring uh, due to an underestimation of your own performance. Um, for example, um, your low perception of your math ability um, may lead to math anxiety. Um, and in a more recent account on the determinants of math anxiety, um, the interpretation account, once interpretation of your previous math experiences is emphasized, um, and this model suggests metacognitive mechanisms that affect uh, math anxiety. It's both an, it's important to keep in mind that it's both an incorrect interpretation of good metacognitive uh, mathematical performance and as an underestimation of your success, as well as a correct interpretation of bad mathematical performance. So correct estimation of when you fail, um, that can lead to anxiety. And finally, um, which is often the case for children with math difficulties, repeated experience of failure together with a growing awareness of that failure, metacognitive awareness of that failure might lead to uh, math anxiousness. Uh, and alternatively, children who perform well uh, will uh, become more aware of their good performance might be uh, less math anxious.
Okay, let's look at an example. Imagine you have a math function and a non-math anxious child solving seven times eight correctly. Um, you could wonder whether a child that is not math anxious uh, is also better at estimating um, their performance and say, okay, was your answer correct? Yes, I think it was correct and I'm pretty sure. Um, while the math anxious child might say, oh, I'm not sure, I, I don't think it's correct. So in this study, uh, we investigated whether there was an association between your estimation of your performance or your monitoring and math anxiety. And if so, if the interplay between these two um, variables had an impact on their um, respective association with uh, arithmetic. For example, I tested uh, the following moderation model. Um, is it the case that the association between monitoring and arithmetic is different for math anxious and non-math anxious children, as I showed in my um, example before? Or um, going to a mediation model, is it the case that the relation between monitoring on the one hand and arithmetic is based on their um, is based on their common relation with mathematics anxiety, um, as you can see here. And to measure math anxiety, um, I used a math anxiety questionnaire for the children. And in this questionnaire, the children were given, uh, given 15 situations involving math that they had to indicate how anxious they would feel in those situations, ranging from not anxious at all, helemaal niet in Dutch, um, to very, very anxious. Uh, and the more anxious they were, um, the higher their score. Uh, the participants were young children, second graders, which I follow up in uh, third grade, all typically developing from Flanders in Belgium and middle to high socioeconomic status. Now let's look at the results. I found an association between monitoring and arithmetic in both second and third grade, as expected. And as expected, I found an association between anxiety and arithmetic. Uh, also um, in second and third grade. And interestingly, I also found an association between monitoring and uh, anxiety. Our uh, longitudinal models are most in line with the theoretical um, reasoning behind it that um, earlier math anxiety limits one's ability to correctly monitor your performance. So anxiety to monitoring rather than the other way around. Um, and when I investigated the predictive power for both uh, monitoring and math anxiety for later arithmetic performance, we saw that when considered together, only monitoring of performance was predictive of later arithmetic performance. And math anxiety was not predictive of performance once monitoring was uh, considered. Uh, Interestingly, once prior performance was taken into account to prior arithmetic performance, there was no evidence for or against the predictive power of monitoring uh, anymore. And only late, uh, early arithmetic was predictive of later arithmetic. On the other hand, I found that Arithmetic had a central role in both processes as it predicted both later monitoring skills and anxiety, even on top of their own respective autoregressors. So early arithmetic achievement predicted growth in, oh, sorry, growth in both monitoring skills and math anxiety, uh, which is most in line with the deficit model. And I think is a very interesting um, idea and result to take into account when you consider education and intervention. Turning to the mediation analysis, I found that the path between monitoring and arithmetic was a direct path. So without, without uh, mediation from math, uh, anxiety um, as the indirect path. Um, and the association between monitoring and arithmetic was does not mediated, mediated by math anxiety. Um, the direct path, on the other hand, between math anxiety and arithmetic was not significant. Um, and um, so, um, if we look at the moderation, the next model is we did not find any evidence for my um, example I gave before. That is that um, the the 
association between monitoring and arithmetic might be different at different levels of math anxiety, nor for the fact that the association between math anxiety and arithmetic might be different at different levels of monitoring. Um, so if I summarize, our results demonstrate that math anxiety and monitoring are indeed correlated uh, concurrently, but also longitudinally, and that the longitudinal association is mostly driven um, from the predictive value of math anxiety on metacognitive monitoring. And these are very interesting results on sich, I think, and should be uh, investigated in further detail in uh, future studies. And when considered simultaneously, um, monitoring and math anxiety, it's mostly monitoring that is important for um, arithmetic achievement and not math anxiety. However, the results of the study clearly indicate that arithmetic achievement in itself is a, an important predictor of both math anxiety and monitoring. Uh, later in development, so emphasizing actually the importance of skill development in the development of math anxiety, uh, metacognitive monitoring, and their interrelations. So what we, can we learn from this results? I, these results, I think, is that the current uh, study revealed the developmental interrelations between math anxiety on the one hand, monitoring on the other hand, and arithmetic achievement in children uh, early in primary school. And this allows us for a better understanding of these processes that underlie um, not only the development of arithmetic, but also the development of these processes um, in, in themselves. Um, and these findings are relevant to design targeted uh, educational interventions, I think. Um, and specifically, I think our study points to targeted interventions that strengthen children's arithmetic achievement um, and as such potentially reduce math anxiety and increase monitoring of children uh, rather than the, the other way uh, around. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank the, ver uh, the lab I'm working in and my two um, PhD supervisors. And if you want to know more about any of these things, uh, you can find me online on these uh, fora. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Alien. I think it's my turn. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep, sounds great. Okay, great. So, okay, so my, I'm Ture Koponen and I'm working as an associate professor in the University of Uvescula and my talk is related to arithmetic fluency and dysfluency. And uh, as we all know, dysfluency in arithmetic is a central feature in mathematical difficulties. And uh, I will give a brief overview of our findings from longitudinal and intervention studies related to arithmetic dysfluency and fluency. And I will start with the study that was published in Child Development 2020. And in that study, we found that about 6% of children saw uh, an undesirable developmental trend in arithmetical fluency from first to fourth grade. So they continuously lag behind their age peers. And the sad thing here is that in the end of the fourth grade, the level of arithmetic fluency, fluency uh, was below that that the uh, second graders typically have had in the end of the second grade. So their tool for solving mathematical problems is not very good or efficient. And uh, when we compared uh, those groups with the uh, different uh, arithmetical developmental trends, we found that uh, uh, poor performance in rapid uh, automatized naming tasks and in verbal counting uh, significantly increased the likelihood of belonging to the mathematical learning difficulties group. And in case that some of you is not familiar with this uh, rapid automated naming task, it is the, we, it's measuring the ability to quickly name aloud a series of familiar items 
such as uh, colors, objects, numbers, or letters. And um, uh, we have confirmed this finding of uh, run and counting as a predictors of fluency in arithmetic and reading in several uh, longitudinal studies. And uh, we have also shown that uh, it, uh, they both predict arithmetic and reading fluency above and behind, beyond the uh, other cognitive skills like a phonological awareness of working memory or processing speed. So the, our next question is that, uh, can we support those children who after several years of schooling are uh, disfluent in arithmetic and they seem to have this kind of like a more general retrieval problems. And uh, this is the question for intervention research. And um, in our project where we focused on self-efficacy and learning difficulties, we implemented uh, intervention um, study or intervention where we have this kind of like a multi-componental uh, strategy approach. And in that intervention, not only by drilling and not only by giving uh, rules to learn uh, by heart, but uh, streng by strengthening the conceptual understanding and trying to tie this piece of knowledge together and kind of like a, using this kind of like a integrative view, we try to help the children improve their uh, calculation fluency. So this is what Anne, uh, Anne was explain, explaining in, her, in this first presentation. So based on the well-known arithmetical facts, uh, children, um, we try to help children to use this information to discover the answer for the um, problem that is not known yet. And so the main ideas of this uh, training was to minimize the amount of the counting that children had to use to restrict the amount of the facts that had to be learned by heart because we know that this is di very difficult for some children. And we try to help them to discover the relations between the arithmetical facts and use the well-known arithmetical facts to uh, derive the answer for unknown problems. And we use this intervention program or actually shortened version of this, um, which is called SELKIS here in Finland. So it means I got it. And uh, about the 60 children from second to fourth grade participated in this intervention. And um, they had a low, they had a low calculation fluency based on this group assessment. So they belong to the lowest uh, 20 percentile. And in individual uh, assessment situation, they also showed the signs of using this counting based strategies. And this intervention was implemented at schools by trained special education teachers and with the help of school assistant in small groups for 12 weeks and two times a week and 45 minutes per session. And then they had th these two uh, gaming sessions per week as well. So rather in intensive training. And uh, those children with uh, disfluent calculation skills improved significantly during this training. And they, re they were able to read their classmates uh, controls who were selected based on the that they were kind of like the next poorest. So their performance level was also below the average, but not performing as low as the, those children who were selected to participate in this intervention. And those control children, they received the business as usual support at schools. However, I, oh, actually the, the good news there that the, those children were able to maintain the level of the uh, arithmetic fluency they reach during the intervention. But the sad thing is that they didn't continue to develop their skill further as did the other groups. So kind of like a 
they start lagging behind their age peers again after this training was over. Um, we were able to find those uh, improvements that we were looking for. So we can see that from pre-test, which is orange, from, to the post-test and to the follow-up, we, we were able to see uh, increase in retrieval and deriving strategies and a decrease in um, counting, in use of counting-based strategies. So kind of like a, the program was working as we wanted. And, um, but as always, not everyone was uh, getting benefits from this training. So there was uh, uh, individual differences in responsiveness. And we wanted to try to look for uh, that who are those children who don't benefit or who are those children who benefit from this training. And uh, we wanted to look both at uh, cognitive predictors like uh, initial calculation fluency level. So uh, calculation fluency level during the pre-assessment and uh, verbal and performance IQ, working memory and rapid naming. And then we wanted to see whether the interest in math or math anxiety or self-efficacy were related to the responsiveness of this intervention. And first we have this model where we included the cognitive predictors. And we can see that not, not the initial level of calculation fluency, not the general uh, uh, verbal or performance level, uh, cognitive level or working memory, but only the rapid naming was related, significantly related to the responsiveness of this intervention. And when we look at the non-cognitive factors, we can see also that after controlling this initial calculation fluency level and general uh, cognitive uh, capability, uh, not interest, not math anxiety, but uh, self-efficacy, only self-efficacy was related to the responsiveness of the intervention. Actually, the math anxiety was, uh, we, we could say that close to being significant predictor, but, but anyway, not significant. So as a conclusions, uh, a risk for dysfluency difficulties in arithmetic can be predicted by run and counting already before the school entry. And uh, multi-componential strategy training helps to improve calculation fluency. And the uh, main point here was that we are not uh, kind of like a, uh, requiring the, uh, only the direct uh, retrieval, so not training only by drilling, but um, helping them um, strengthen by strengthening their conceptual understanding, we will help them to use maybe rather narrow sets of arithmetical facts that they have. Uh, of course, we train, so train something has to be known very well. But the main point is that what they know well, they cannot use it to kind of like discover the answers for the unknown problems. And what we try to do is help them to use those well-known problems like a 10 pairs, what they know or what, what, what has been practiced during this intervention to use that knowledge. And that's important thing that they have this conceptual understanding how the arithmetical facts are related. And it's also related to understanding the magnitude and use the uh, magnitude information when they are calculating uh, because some of the children are really not using, they don't, think that the five plus six has to be one more than five plus five. So some addition is uh, something else to them. It's not necessarily related to magnitude information, unfortunately. So we kind of like uh, have to strengthen the conceptual understanding of the uh, different arithmetic operations and seeing the relation between uh, number concept and, and also the counting se sequence. So that's that's what is needed. And we can, by doing so, we can help them. They can improve their calculation fluency despite that they kind of like have, uh, 
they have disfluency problems and they have several years of schooling and they are still disfluent. But we know that we can help them. But the interesting is that rapid naming continues to predict, be a kind of like an important predictor of the responsiveness to this kind of training as well. Uh, kind of like a, uh, I think that this is indication that we need to do some more work and some, some adaptation is needed. Maybe we should analyze whether the longer or more, even more intensive intervention could work better for those children uh, who are having this like a severe problems in this kind of like a rapid naming. Or maybe, maybe we should continue after this intensive training phase, after we should maybe include this kind of like a regular rehearsal that is uh, implemented in classroom. So maybe after this intensive phase, we could do something, something more like a rehearsal type of like a practicing part of the everyday schooling. So maybe that would be something that could help. And uh, the one thing that is important that non-cognitive factors matters too. So in this uh, study, uh, we asked the self-efficacy, the questions that we use in this analysis was that whether the child believed that they can learn to calculate more fluently. And we found that the feeling or the belief that they can learn is important factor because those who believe that they can learn, they also learn more. And how we can increase this self-efficacy. There are several things to take into account, but uh, one of the main, main issue is that uh, uh, providing master experiences and uh, one very important thing there seems to be is that uh, making this improvement visible for students so that even though that they have difficulties that they would believe that when they are working, they can see the improvement. So they are learning. So that's maybe something that, that is something that seems to be one critical kind of like element in this kind of like a self-efficacy support. Thank you, Kiitos. Thank you very, very much. Um, okay, um, th thanks a lot. Maybe um, if um, people have questions that they'd um, like to ask, has anyone got any questions for any of us, any or all of us speakers in this symposium? If people don't have questions at the moment, they can email any or all of us about the topics. I would like to thank everyone who uh, took part in this symposium. And for organizing this. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here today. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I hope that um, I didn't mess up the technical issues too much. I, um, at one point, I was trying to invite Twira and found I was muted. But fortunately, the army stepped in. Thanks. Um, very, very much. Thank you all, everyone, and we will see you next Thursday for our next symposium. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Goodbye.